go ahead and start off this topic since the clock is already ticking. And we'll start with you, Dr. Grossman. You've been a data scientist for a long time. Talk about your experience of what we've learned and where we're headed, particularly as we link that knowledge back down to precision medicine. Thank you. So uh, I, I, I think, you know, from the viewpoint of a data scientist, um, you know, this precision medicine is a little later than other fields in terms of sharing data and sharing it at scale. And I think that's, that's natural because there's a lot of economic value in the data and there's, it's a very complicated ecosystem with various incentives and disincentives to sharing. There was a famous uh, data scientist named Jim Gray at Microsoft, and he built the first sort of large-scale data sharing project for astronomy data. And he was asked, why did he do that? And he said, because no one, there's no value in astronomy data except to astronomers. So it's very easy to figure out how to share the data, how to get the answers out, and how to do that with all the data in the world that's related to astronomy. It's much harder in this space. And as you know, one of the things we launched on June 6 was the NCI Genomic Data Commons, which contains data from NCI-funded research projects, the genomic data and associated clinical data. And I think that's a nice step forward into sort of um, making that a data available to those people that need it. Maybe we'll move on to Dr. Abernathy and you can talk about your experience in, in Flatiron and particularly not only how you capture the data, how you standardize it, how you group so you can really get some great insights around that information. You know, as I think about this land of big data and its role in supporting precision medicine, I kind of go back to some of the basics, which is that first, data needs to be organized and made consistent and credible in a way that now it's rapidly analyzable. And, and so if, if we think about the role of, in particular, clinical data, which Bob mentioned, um, it's very messy. And getting clinical data to be a, in a place where it is consistently organized means that one of the things we've got to do is figure out how to work with what we often call unstructured documents or data that are hidden in places in the medical record that are hard to get to, like the medical case notes or radiology reports. And we've got to be able to do the hard work of now organizing that into complete data sets that have also, in a patient, patient um, confidential and safe manner identifiers that then can link to the other kind of data sets that Bob mentioned, such as genomics and other things. And so some of the things that we've done at Flatiron are focus on how do you organize really some of the fundamentals of the data sets and how do you make sure you maintain patient identifiers in a safe way so that then you can actually link them to create a bigger data pool. Now, Kathy, you've taken this one step further in your organization invested, I believe, $40 million um, in a study to really understand and link the genetic makeup back to the patient and build those patient subgroups. Talk about the learnings from Compass. Was it worth it? What did you learn? Um, tell us about those experiences. This morning we were actually talking about multiple myeloma, which is always interesting to have the disease come up so often at meetings, but the truth is myeloma has probably seen um, more progress than any other cancer today. We've had 10 drugs approved and we've tripled the lifespan of our patients. And the reason for that is the myeloma community is highly networked. We're all connected and always working together. And the MMRF writes the strategic plan for our network of scientists and clinicians and pharma companies so we prioritize our efforts. We saw the one gaping hole was the ability to share data. It's just really hard for the academic centers to do it. We wanted genomic data. The community centers weren't necessarily doing genomic data. So we made the decision five years ago that we would spend $40 million of philanthropic and uh, also develop a partnership with pharma to fund 1,000 patients being sequenced before they ever started treatment, that moment of vulnerability where you really need that precious tissue. But we would also add their clinical data and we would follow them for their entire journey with myeloma. We also said that anybody in the study, there were 100 centers involved, had to give up IP. All data would go into the public domain where it would be shared. So, so many new ideas five years ago and everybody was saying to us, there is no way they're gonna do that. No way, you'll never get 1,000 patients enrolled. You'll never get academia to do it. You'll never get everybody to put it in the public domain. So now I can look at you and safely say, yes, it was worth the $40 million because the Compass study is now the largest genomic data set for any cancer in the world. 
in the world. And myeloma, we have 20,000 patients diagnosed each year. So the little teeny tiny cancer is really showing the world how to do it. And yes, we are getting amazing findings from the COMPASS study, um, and it's in two areas that we all talked about during the, all the morning sessions. The first area is how do we find new targets and validate current targets so we can drive drug de development forward. We have to understand that space, especially for high-risk myeloma patients. And the second is how do we combine that clinical data to make sure that we understand if we have 10 drugs approved, how are we using them? How do we use them effectively and efficiently? And so that's why it's like a really, this is a banner day for us at the MMRF because we're also making the announcement this morning that we're now taking our entire Compass data set and it is moving over to Bob Grossman and Lou Stout at the Genomic Data Commons and combining it um, with that data set. And now it's the largest cancer in the GDC today, brought to them for the first time by an organization. And Amy and I are in constant discussions because at the end of the day, we have great genomic, clinical, longitudinal data, but we still have lots of questions that a lot of really good clinical data can back us on, on how do we use drugs so that the patients all benefit. And that's where we have to move, building these kinds of partnerships. Working together. Yep. So building upon that, one aspect we've talked about here is that data sharing. And obviously, this is a great example of initiative coming together mm -hmm and eliminating the concept of the data island, that we all have great pockets of information, but we don't leverage that. Maybe, Dr. Grossman, you could talk about the open source concept that you've developed that helps facilitate that data sharing. There's other aspects we'll get into, but the data sharing is a key aspect of that. I, I do, and I want to put it in the context of what Amy just said, which is why is data sharing is important? It's important because we don't understand this field well enough to process the data consistently in different places, to put the clinical data in in the right way, and just to get the relevant information out. Because that relevant information, you know, 20 years from now or whenever, is small enough that there's not a big sharing problem. The reason it's important to share and share at scale is we need the raw data so that we can harmonize it. We need good processes on the clinical data. And one of the things that Genomic Data Commons does is reprocess the data with the same pipeline, so no matter where the data came from, um, you know, it, it, there may be some differences, but the best we can do is at least consistently process it with consistent procedures. And that's why it's so important to have a critical mass of publicly available data. Um, um, and that's why we're so excited to have this additional data set so it could be analyzed consistently with all the data and with all the other genomic data and associated clinical data. And when uh, a researcher somewhere discovers a new pipeline, a new way to look at variants, a new way to look at gene fusions, a new way to look at methylation data, we can run that over all the data and make those results available. So I think that's why we're excited. And, one of the things we did is our commons, the NCI Genomic Data Commons, um, is an open source stack, so it, it could be used by other groups to build commons, and um, it, uh, gr other groups can extend it and build apps over it. So it's not a repository. It, it's an active resource that interoperates with anyone who wants to build an app um, with that API. So I think that's, uh, that's why open source is important here, is it's moving from static collections of data that are analyzed in papers to active collections of data that's available to any authorized researcher that signs the right documents who can then write an application or another system that can interoperate to create sort of what you might think of as a deep knowledge network. Because we have to go just from publications and best practices to constant reanalysis with best practices. And Amy and I were just talking, it's hard to do this right. And unless you have, you know, people with a deep understanding of the data and deep access to the data, you can't get the deep knowledge out. That's right. So one aspect we talked about is certainly about sharing and, and access to that data. The next question is what to do with it. Um, Dr. Abernathy, talk about the challenges that we all face as we start to pull this information, which is a good step in the right direction, but start to put together actionable insights, knowing how to manage the data, knowing how to read the data, and then building credibility around the data so people actually use it. So, so what Bob just brought up and you've you know, exposed is this important point that as we pull the data together, 
um, there's not suddenly then a button that we push and bam, we get all the new um, insights that we want to understand. We actually have to now have a consistent, incredible way to analyze the data. And, and really what's happening is as we have data pooling together, we're unlocking the next big frontier, which is how do we consistently analyze the information. We, we've had lots of conversations about the role of machine learning, and I think there are many important places for machine learning and artificial intelligence within the context of data analysis, but let's think about the task we've got in front of us within health. When we analyze the data and we want to ask the question, how do we use this new analysis to push healthcare forward, we actually want to also ask, is it better than what we were doing before? And so we have to have credible analyses that allow us to ask that comparative question and decide what to replace and where to continue to move forward. And that needs to be transparent. It needs to be set on top of an open and common layer where we can all understand and run similar analyses ourselves. And then we also have to have a way of interpreting that and, con and communicating that interpretation in a confident way that doctors and patients know how to use. This is a really important point because we don't live in that static world. This is constantly be dynamic. We're going to learn more information as we go along and we need to systematize that process that facilitates that learning mm -hmm. instead of being stuck in a moment of time. And one last point there is that that means that even the way we currently publish information, right, which is fairly static, is going to need to start to become more dynamic. So we have to even rethink how do we communicate in a dynamic framework that clinicians then have access to at point of care. And that brings up who is the, and this came up this morning too, who is the trusted third party that drives this? So, you know, number one, you have to figure out what questions are you answering for that cancer, and hopefully it spreads across all cancers, but for that specific cancer. So, you know, for us, we may wake up and say, our patients need to know, should they do a stem cell transplant or should they not? So we had to aggregate all of our data to decide, yes, actually transplant plays a huge role in myeloma today. But with all the drugs approved, the next question was, should every patient be started on a triplet or a doublet? Turned out triplets do better, but that doesn't mean it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then what is high risk? But I think what you also have to do is work as a trusted third party, bringing all the partners together as well as academia and pharma, and say, what are the questions we still have now? And that is, if we all look different as patients, then why are we all starting on the same drug? And if we all get into a remission, but it's different, a stringent CR, a CR, or partial re um, remission, do we all need to stay on maintenance therapy as long? And which maintenance therapy? And then there was a discussion this morning about can we prevent these diseases? Well, you can. I mean, myeloma starts with MGUS, moves to smoldering, and goes to active. If we could stop the disease in its tracks, imagine how happy the payers would be. If we could say, if you're in a stringent CR, you only have to be on maintenance for you know, six months as opposed to five years, imagine how happy everybody would be. So I think it comes back to trusted third parties coming in, and I'm not always sure who that could be. We've been fortunate that we're kind of a patient-run, patient-led community that can really drive the answering of the questions. But I still wonder, like, how do you do this across cancers? Because when you get to the, how do you want to structure the fields and standardize the data, you do need experts coming in and helping you with that. Because how you structure it and standardize it is important, but it has to work for everybody. And certainly scaling this is something we'll talk about as we go along, but I'm, I'm interested to engage one aspect of the industry, which is the patient, yeah. right? Um, and how do you engage the patient from the beginning, getting them to participate in the trials? How do you engage with them in terms of using this great information and educating them about the options and what it means right. to them? Talk about the patient perspective and how we can really make this centric and using this data, but not overwhelm the patient with so much information <laughs> that makes them a bit dizzy. So um, as, a, as a myeloma patient myself, this part is, um, somewhat easier that you know, we can explain to people that I didn't beat the odds by luck. I, it was you know, having a certain amount of wisdom and, and handling the journey well. But I think it's also explaining to patients, sometimes they relate to stories more than they relate to just saying to them, share the data. But So an example is I have myeloma. Um, my grandfather had myeloma. My identical twin sister 
has stage three breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And our grandmother had breast cancer. Our mother has melanoma, our dad died of renal cell carcinoma. So when you are an outlier, and now we are, identical twins do this, what, what do you do? So we ended up going to the Mayo Clinic and actually having germline done and doing everything we could so that our data would be shared, hoping that they would start to understand like uncertain genes, what's going on there? Are there some that you know, really could be validated by our work? But in addition to that, and this is where the cost savings comes in for each patient is, I was told you're at high risk, you need to go on prophylactic breast cancer drugs. But it turned out by doing that testing, I'm really not at high risk. Mm. And so I didn't go on those drugs. Now I'm monitored more carefully. So when you have these stories, and mine is one of thousands that we all could share, right? I think it becomes really important to educate the patient on the importance of their tissue and their data and being part of the research process. It will help their individual journey, first of all, with the wisdom they get. But when their data gets aggregated, like we keep saying to them, please aggregate it, that's where the wisdom comes in. And how do we take those insights and drive them to the clinic or work with groups here today to say, and how do we drive optimization of the drugs that are available? And data is going to do all of this, and it's happening right now. So, and I want to add one thing to that, which is that we need to make sure our data sets include how patients feel. Right. So it's very important that as a person is really asking the question, what does this mean for me? It also lines up with what my experience looks like today. And so um, an, an area of focus that's really becoming more substantive across the U.S. is how do we include patient concerns like symptoms and quality of life into our data sets and how do we do that at scale. And then also, as we are collecting patient reported information in the clinic, how do we help clinicians now interpret the large big data insights back into the clinic in a real-time way in the context of this individual patient. And so part of also making sure that this feels connected to patients is making sure that the experience that you're talking about within the research and within the data sets is consistent with pa what patients are seeing every day. Dr. And, Grossman. And I, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the roadmap uh, for the genomic data commons and other data commons that are going to peer with it. And part of that roadmap um, and this was uh, described a bit in a New England Journal of Medicine article that came out last week. Um, part of that roadmap is to get the patient involved, to get patient contributed data. And that's not easy. And so I'm gonna, I'll do a shout out for one of the projects out of Harvard um, with a, a number of um, medical re research companies called the um, Sync for Science. I think in our roadmap for the S4S, in our roadmap for the Genomic Data Commons and other commons that are going to interoperate transparently with the genomic data commons to bring even more data in, we're going to use the Sync for Science interface. What this will do over time, and this is being used um, by the um, Precision Medicine Initiative, um, and it's being supported by Google and Vanderbilt, um, is it's going to interface with the EMR system so that um, in a way that Hopefully, it certainly moves the, 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 the ball down the field. It will bring the data out of the EMR system in such a way that that patient can contribute the data. And so the, I had a meeting about this a couple days ago. The, the, our our, our, our um, vision is you can, um, if a patient um, um, uses Sync for Science to include themselves in the PMI million cohort, and they include themselves in the roadmap for the Genomic Data Commons cohort, then those two commons can communicate and can ex share, exchange data in a way that's consistent with the patient wishes so that we enrich both data sets with relevant data. Because in the end, it's the patient's data, and the sooner we can take the patient's wishes, yet put it in a way that the fields are there in a meaningful way, and the critical mass of data to accelerate understanding what combination of drugs for what treatments, for what, uh, for what cancer, at what time, the better we are. So I, I think that's a natural roadmap. And this is where we learn so much from other industries, right? Because we're all trying to understand how do you get patients to engage, and then how do you keep them with you for the long haul? You, you need that for clinical data, we need it for genomic data. Otherwise, we're not going to find out when they relapsed and get that data in. So um, another program that we're doing uh, up at Harvard Business School under um, Robert Kraft's endowment is we went out to all the companies that are really good in the direct-to-consumer space that understand how to use data to drive branding, 
engagement, adoption, retention, and monetization. So we're convening a group, but it's a, it's a fascinating group because it's the CEO of Rent the Runway, along with the head of innovation at Under Armour, along with who does the loyalty programs at CVS. And we're basically lining them up with the groups that do all the direct-to-patient work. And then it could be foundation medicine, patients like me. But then we're also lining them up with the people that are in a movement, like who wants to really rally the patients around the cause? Obama, PMI, Biden, MMRF, prostate cancer. And so by keeping these groups small, um, it's really effective because we share best practices and we're all trying to deal with the same thing. And it makes you think differently. It like disrupts the system so that we're not keeping our blinders on in healthcare and only doing it the way we've all been taught. We're just generating new thoughts and trying to bring them back to everybody. So before we move to the questions, the one last one I have for all of you is lacking that, that identified trusted third party who can bring this all together. How do we push this forward? What's the single biggest thing that can be done? It's a lot of great collaboration that's happening. We need more collaboration coming from a variety of entities. In all of your opinion, what's the single most important thing that can be done to further what is a really interesting and valuable insight that we're going to be able to get for precision medicine? I would say the, the most important piece is leadership. In order for you to watch where the ecosystem is going, because it's so broad when you move from genomics to data to diagnostic, to, it's, it's crazy trying to get everybody in the room. How do you do that and get everybody to play? It takes a certain amount of leadership. It takes looking for the disruptive leaders that actually want to make a difference, that care about curing cancer and making a difference in that space. And then it also takes deciding who's going to fund it. So is that coming out of a consortium model? Is that coming out of philanthropy? Is it coming out of industry in a consortium model? Like you, you have to decide how you would build this. Because I hate to say this, but it's all about business and driving new models and incentives where everybody has a win. And that always takes money and leadership. Mm -hmm. So I'd point to highly credible use cases. Mm -hmm. Examples where everybody can point to and say, I know what that is, and I know that that's reliable information. One of the things that we focused on is partnering with the FDA, mm -hmm. because um, in my mind, if we can say, well, here's a credible bar, and if we can meet the expectations of regulators like the FDA, then the work that we're doing also meets the expectations of many others in science and clinical care. and so. One of the things that we've been doing right now is actually giving the data to the FDA and having, having them reflect back to us on data quality and the information and how that they can ultimately make decisions based on this kind of information. Because I think very credible use cases that we can all point to that says, this is how we move the field forward because we've done data sharing and because we've actually gotten the data ready and clean enough to drive insights will then help everybody see what it looks like. And uh, I just point on, uh, so my, what I think is, is absolutely important is concrete, con concrete steps by trusted partners to bring together silos of data and interoperate them at scale. So I just want to end this part of this session by highlighting again the announcement that Kathy just did. This is the, uh, the MMF with the National Cancer Institute with the um, Genomic Data Commons deciding that very concretely we can bring these things together and create um, one larger um, uh, collection of data that's harmonized that will sort of move us forward. And the more groups that do that, the more foundations that do that, um, the more collections of medical research centers that do that, um, um, the further we'll move along. And you don't have to make a single choice. A medical research center can participate along multiple partnerships. Um, they can participate with multiple vendors. They, it's a very complicated space. There's a lot of value to be unlocked. There are a lot of spectacular vendor solutions, but there are also ways to, get, to put that data into an open commons that can contribute at scale. Kathy, maybe a question. What are your thoughts about ways to even increase the engagement of patients? So, you know, I think one of the, the parts that is missing in the data set is not as much more information now in genes, but on the phenotype. So, so how do we get patients even more involved in the nuanced details? I, I would presume that patients would be even more wanting to be, to be part of that quality. Exactly. So I think 
you know, what we're moving through now is at the MMR, if we have a certain number of patients that are connected to us, you know, a thousand, we have incredibly deep genomic, clinical, and longitudinal data on them. We have an addition of 500 more that are relapsed refractory. We have hundreds more that are smoldering. So we keep building on that genomic data set. But the point Raphael's making, and I agree, is not every patient has to be sequenced, you know, and give us their, you know, their genomics, their immune, everything about them. We're just as happy if patients are coming in and getting engaged, giving us their email, their text phone number, everything that we need to stay in touch with them on trials. We are finding, however, the only way, and, and other people are doing this actually better than we are, the only way you get patients engaged is by sharing the stories with them, making it simple for them to understand they do not know their data is not shared. They don't know that. So we have to say it to them in a nice way, because if you say it to them in the wrong way, they think you're coming after their doctor. And that's not the point. We're not coming after their doctor. We're just saying, you could go direct. One way or another, we really do want your data shared. Um, and then the second piece is helping them to understand there's different levels of data. And when they trust us, they start with the, the baby steps. This is kind of like the Susan Love Army of Women model. or Then they start to build on that. And that's exactly what the Obama PMI is doing. If you look at their program, they have several different um, phases that patients get involved in. And you know, they, they name them A, B, or C, depending on how much data they're getting. But you want everybody connected to you. And it's, it's a marketing issue. It's really a marketing issue right now. So I'll leave with one last question for, for the panel. What is the world of possibilities here? If we get it all right, where can we head? And what is the time frame that we can head? This is a hard question. I'm sure it's one that you've all given some thoughts. Where can we head with all this? I'll just say one sentence. Um, I just want in five years when we ask for, you know, when we take um, the genomic information, look at the molecular subtype and ask the simplest question, for that molecular subtype at, that, at this time, what's the best combination of drugs for that patient at this time? We have a better answer that's evidence-based on what we know at that time. It just, that's my five-year goal. My five-year goal is acceleration to new knowledge. So if it's going to take us 14 to 17 years in the current model to get to new knowledge, I want to see it happening in six, maybe three months. Um, right now, we're generating data sets um, to answer very, very uh, complicated clinical questions in two to three months. And then it takes about another two, three months to analyze them. I want to see us shorten those things so that we go from 14 to 17 years to, to three or six months to get to something that actually changes patient care. And, and for me, I would say in five years, my dream would be that um, every cancer patient's connected and we're connecting to each other, not just in our own little myeloma or pancreatic or other silo that we have used data to understand what that journey should look like, and that they understand that journey means they should go to the right center and see the right doctor, they should be started on the right treatment that we can define based off of data. If they get into remission, they know what to do with that remission. If they need to stay on maintenance therapy, they know what to do with it, and that that journey is now becoming available to them on an app on their phone. And I also see a world where we start to really focus on prevention because I would never, ever want my children to go through what they've watched me or my sister go through. And um, I think we can get there. And I, I think we all have a purpose in this room together to make sure that that happens. And I thank everybody for being here because we all live and breathe in the healthcare space. And we really are making incredible, incredible progress. So thanks to all of you. Well, in a short period of time, we've learned a lot, and I certainly thank all the panelists for their insights about the importance and initiatives that are already happening about data sharing, the importance of taking that to the next level, um, being able to create actionable insights, um, and the challenges that we face. And I think, Kathy, one point that we all need to take to heart is leadership, and the fact that it's not going to come from one single entity and one single perspective, um, but it's certainly something that can have a great impact.